The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Well, thank you, Michelle. I'd, I'd like to welcome everybody to the short course, uh, the, the people I know and the people I've yet to meet. And uh, uh, we have a pretty good program for you here this morning. Uh, I'm uh, Jim Cutts, as Michelle said. I'm manager of uh, strategic missions and advanced concepts uh, for solar system exploration at JPL. And I would, at this point, like to introduce my other two co-leads, uh, who uh, I'd like to stand, Dave Stevenson from Caltech, and David Mamoon, and I'm going to ask him to pronounce his institution. <laughs> He's a ESA. Oh, I should have done that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry okay. about that. Okay. Uh, University of Toulouse. <laughs> University of Toulouse. Uh, so at this point, uh, we're going to plunge directly into the into the presentations. We have. Uh, put together presentations <coughs> here which uh, we have designed to provide the workshop participants with a shared uh, background and knowledge <coughs> that we're going to be working on. Uh, in addition, we hope it's uh, beneficial to the, uh, to the uh, other people who have joined us this morning, that there will be enough uh, information here that they will come away with something. Um, the bulk of the subject matter of the workshop has yet to be done. We're, we're here to complete a study uh, on uh, how we can uh, implement a Venus seismology mission ultimately to learn more about the interior structure of Venus. But that's yet to come. So let me begin by introducing our first speaker, <coughs> which is one of my colleagues, Dave Stevenson, who's professor of planetary science at Caltech has been at Caltech since 1980, I believe, and uh, made a number of contributions in Venus and many other parts of planetary science. So let's give Dave a big hand. Thank you, Jim, and it's good to see you all. So my task is to talk about the major science questions for Venus. and. I have decided on a compromise. On the one hand, we are at the beginning of a workshop on Venus seismology, and so it's desirable to make some contact with the science of importance for understanding the interior of Venus, the kind of science that you could do with seismic techniques. On the other hand, I believe strongly that if you want to understand a planet, indeed, if you want to understand planets in general, you have to talk about them in their totality. You have to talk about them holistically. And that is the path I've taken, except that it's still a compromise because given the limited time, I'm not going to do justice to some very important scientific questions that have to do, for example, with atmospheric dynamics, atmospheric chemistry, and so forth, simply because they have a less strong connection. They're still very important, but they have a less strong connection to the main goals of this workshop. <clears throat> so we're dealing here with a planet, Venus, that is very similar in size and mass to the Earth, even looks similar actually in the UV as you see in this picture here taken by Galileo. But of course, it is a planet that has a very different atmosphere and a very different surface. From the perspective that we now have of planets in general that we gain from studies of planets around other stars, we see again two planets, Venus and Earth, that are very close to each other, for example, in this space of radius versus mass, compared to the extraordinary diversity of planets that we see around other stars. And this plot here, which was published in Nature just last week, shows the extraordinary number of planets. In this case, we don't have masses, but planetary radius 1 here corresponds to the Earth, and there's a very large number of bodies around stars of many different metallicities. And this is a reminder to us that when we speak of Earth and Venus, 
we're talking about two planets that are remarkably similar, at least in respect of radius and mass, but in a context of planets that can have an extraordinary range of composition, size, radii, and masses. <clears throat> so here we are with a planet that is our nearest planetary neighbor, and yet we know so little about it. And of course, the reason for this is not that it is uninteresting or unimportant, but rather that it is difficult to get to know. Not difficult to get to, but difficult to get to know because of the dense atmosphere, because of the extreme conditions on the surface. And as a consequence, it has received less attention in the history of planetary exploration than other planets. Uh, and of course, it is surely just as important as Earth in understanding the formation, evolution, and nature of terrestrial planets. So there can be no doubt that we have a great need to understand Venus. Now, when I was a young boy uh, reading comics and science fiction, our picture back in the 50s for Venus was a, a swampy place with all sorts of exotic animals, dinosaurs, and so forth, lorded over by a super intelligent being, Mekong. Uh, but of course, we have come to appreciate that, in fact, uh, Venus is nothing like that. Um, it is, in fact, a nasty place. And uh, in the way that planetary exploration has developed, there has, certainly within NASA, uh, been an emphasis on talking about habitability. And in that respect, uh, Venus does not come out particularly well, even though, of course, one can always turn the question around and say, why is it that Venus is not habitable. That is an important scientific question. And so the fact that it's a less desirable place by comparison to us should not be an argument against understanding it better. So let's do a comparison. And at this point, it's a summary table, two tables. And each of these points will be developed in more detail as we go along. These bodies have very similar radius and very similar mean density. And in fact, when you take into account the 20% lower central pressure of Venus, the difference in densities, mean densities, is mostly, if not entirely, accounted for just by the effect of pressure. So if you try and make a model of Venus assuming that it has the same basic composition as, as the Earth, you get pretty close. In fact, uh, within Erebar, the right answer. So in terms of explaining that mean density, there is no reason to suppose that the structure of Venus, the bulk composition of Venus, is significantly different from the Earth. <clears throat> and of course, both planets show evidence for basaltic volcanism. The uh, the style of that volcanism, the details are very different, and I will say a bit more about that. But indeed, uh, on Earth we have basaltic volcanism predominantly coming from mid-ocean ridges, but also from uh, uh, hotspot volcanism and arc volcanism in the case of Venus. A lot of the volcanism we think is associated with something that at least morphologically looks like hotspot volcanism. Uh, but certainly, from the only missions that we have that have gone to the surface, the Venera missions, we have the compositional information that the surface is consistent with basalt, obviously very limited sampling. Uh, and of course, we see the volcanic constructs in the radar maps. Earth, of course, uh, is known to have a large iron-rich core, about one-third of the mass of the Earth. And in the case of Venus, we think that the structure is similar, although, in fact, we don't actually know that. So 
When I say inferred, I don't mean that there are data that directly point to this. Rather, I mean that when we think about how a planet like this should work, given that we have to satisfy the observed mean density, it's hard to imagine any alternative to saying that Venus has a large iron core. And curiously, if you look at the part of the carbon budget that we have access to, which in the case of the Earth is CO2 bound up in rocks and to some extent uh, in the ocean, a very small amount in the atmosphere, uh, if we look at that inventory, it's very similar to what we actually see in the atmosphere of Venus. It's possible that this is coincidence because the total amount of carbon is not known in either planet, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in this form. The speciation could be different. But this is at least a suggestion that there is some similarity in the volatile inventory of the two bodies. But of course, Venus has a thin atmosphere, uh, primarily nitrogen and some oxygen, and of course, we have a water ocean. Venus has the thick atmosphere that comes because the carbon dioxide component is in the atmosphere rather than bound up in rocks, and we think it has much less water. I will come back to this, but let me make the point already. We do not know how much water Venus has. It's only assumed that there is no water in the interior. We do not actually know that. But certainly the part of Venus that we have access to, that we have measurements of, is largely devoid of water. And of course, very significantly, Earth has a thermal regime, a regime of its heat engine, that is expressed in the form of plate tectonics. And plate tectonics is a process uh, whereby the surface layer, the plates, participate in the means of expelling heat from the interior. And this means, of course, a tremendous mobility, lateral motion, as well as recycling of that surface layer. And these things are not apparent on Venus for the present day. There is a great deal of debate about the extent to which Venus may have had a mobile regime in the past, and I will come back to that later. Um, but at the present, we think that Venus is in a regime that is called stagnant lid, in which there is, to be sure, convection in the interior carrying heat to the surface, but the surface layer is not participating in that circulation. And uh, as a consequence, um, there is much less uh, mobility of the surface layers, although presumably some deformation. <clears throat> Earth, of course, has a rotation period that has been set about through the evolution of the Earth-Moon system. The Earth-Moon system uh, has, at present, 80% of its angular momentum in the orbital motion of the Moon, only 20% left in the Earth. So the Earth is actually a slow rotator. This is important. The Earth is a slow rotator in the context of the total angular momentum budget that you might plausibly get in the process of forming the planet. But strikingly, uh, Venus has a very slow rotation period. And uh, as I will argue later, it's the smallness of this that is of interest, not so much the fact that it's retrograde, although that is of interest too. And of course, uh, related, these numbers are connected, and I think these numbers are connected too, as I will explain later, uh, Earth has a large moon and Venus has no moon. And I would argue that the absence of something requires as much attention as the presence of something. There's not as much as you can measure, but understanding why Venus has no moon is actually a very important scientific question. And indeed, uh, another striking feature of the Earth is that it can generate a large magnetic field, a dynamo process in the liquid outer core of the Earth has maintained Earth's magnetic field for as long as we have a geologic record, 3.5 billion years. 
We don't know in the first billion years, but from paleomagnetic evidence, we know that Earth has had a magnetic field at least for that period of time. In the case of Venus, there is no intrinsic magnetic field, and because the surface rocks are hot, uh, it's not at all clear that you could retain any memory of previous magnetic field. That's a close call. It depends on the mineralogy and the domain sizes. <clears throat> now, at this point, I want to inject a, a philosophical comment about the structure of the talk I'm giving you, and that is that, indeed, when we think about any planet, and in particular Venus, everything connects to everything else. So one of the important points I want to make to you is that these features that I listed in the previous slides are interconnected. I think, for example, that Earth's dynamo is connected to the fact that you have plate tectonics, because plate tectonics is an efficient way of cooling the planet. I think that the presence and absence of a moon is intimately connected to the history of the planet. The, uh, Nature of the atmosphere and whether you have water is intimately connected to the convective regime. I could go on and on. And that, of course, is why I've structured this talk to be a broad sweep of many different problems rather than focusing in immediately on the things that you might traditionally think are connected to seismology. <clears throat> so in getting into a little bit more detail, Let's talk for a few minutes about what happens when planets form. Because, of course, eventually that's one of the things we would like to understand. We would like to understand the outcome of the planet formation process and the extent to which it makes Earth and Venus different. One of the games that you can play, and a number of people have played this, including John Chambers, uh, Alessandro Morbidelli, and others, is to imagine creating an ensemble of planetesimals that are in orbit around the sun in the very earliest period of the solar system, and then letting the system run with the planetesimals crashing into each other, with the action of gravity causing the material to coalesce into bigger and bigger bodies. And this game has been played with some success in the sense that you can explain roughly why it is that the terrestrial planetary system that we have is capable of producing of order four planets, sometimes three, sometimes five in these simulations. And then you can ask the question, what is the similarity and difference between Earth and Venus in such a story? And the answer is that because the material that goes into the construction of the planets comes from a variety of radii, the material that goes into Venus and the material that goes into the Earth is unlikely to be significantly different. But that because in the end game we are dealing with a small number of bodies, stochastic differences can arise. And I will come back to this because this is an important point. The specific details of how the Earth was put together and when it got a moon and why it got a moon are likely to be different from the specific details that Venus went through, even though the basic materials are likely to be very similar. And so chance plays a role. This is not a deterministic process, and chance will play a role in determining some of the differences between Earth and Venus. <coughs> so it's not difficult, in fact, to make models where Earth and Venus are, are similar in mass and in composition. And it is difficult to make models where Earth is substantially different from Venus in bulk composition. And it is difficult, and this is important, to make models where Venus receives much less water than the Earth because we believe that the delivery of water to the terrestrial planets was part of the basic accretion process in the terrestrial zone. It was not uh, sensitive to precisely how far away you are from the sun the bodies that had water in them that were out near Jupiter can be delivered equally well to Venus as to Earth. And in our current understanding of terrestrial planet formation, the amount of water that was delivered to Venus should have been very similar to the Earth because Earth and Venus are similar in mass, and distance from the sun is not very important for that issue. <coughs> now, of course, this is theory, and uh, 
when posing questions, you have to ask, how do you go about deciding these things? Is it just a fairy tale, or is there something of substance to this? And for that reason, it's of interest to look for isotopic differences. And one of those, one of those very interesting ones is oxygen, because, of course, Earth and the Moon are indistinguishable in oxygen isotopes, what they call cap delta. Earth and Mars are different. What is Venus? It is an extraordinary fact that we have this missing piece of information that is so vital in, in understanding the character of these planets. I've made this point before, and it was uh, amusing to receive an email just three weeks ago. Uh, Dear Mr. Stevenson, perhaps you are interested in rock from Venus. Uh, um, he even sent a picture. <laughs> and he sent me the oxygen isotope values, which are indistinguishable from the Earth. Um, I, did not <laughs> I did not choose to buy the rock. Um, of course, he wanted to sell it. Um, uh, he is a legitimate uh, meteorite uh, uh, entrepreneur, shall we say. Um, it is possible. It is possible to get a rock from Venus although kind of unlikely, uh, and we should not give, on, give up on the fact that hidden away in museums somewhere we have a piece of Venus. But in all likelihood, we have to go there to get information of this kind. <clears throat> so let me talk now a little about why Venus has no moon, because I think this is an interesting issue. One possibility, of course, is that it never had one. But if you think through how to get Venus to its low spin state, that actually poses a problem. Because in the accumulation process of a planet like Venus, as we understand it, it is next to impossible to get Venus initially in a slow spin state. Not impossible, but extremely improbable. On the other hand, if you had a moon at some point, then because of tidal evolution, you can extract angular momentum from Venus just as Earth has had angular momentum extracted from it by the moon. And then if you lose that moon, you have a greater likelihood of getting into the right spin state. So one very attractive idea is that it had one at one time and lost it. It may then escape into orbit around the sun, perhaps come back and crash into Venus. Uh, it can also spiral in and crash. The working hypothesis when we think about planets is that giant impacts are an unavoidable consequence of how the planets are put together. And we think that must surely be true in the case of Venus as it is for Earth. And so the difference between Earth and Venus, uh, we think, has something to do with the chance circumstances of how the planets were put together. And uh, what might be the case is that the major difference is that the formation of the moon for Earth was the last big event in the terrestrial zone. So in that sense, we are special. And it actually matters that just by chance, it was the last major event in the terrestrial zone. And the events of similar character that took place for Venus were earlier. <coughs> now, the, the moon of Venus has a name, by the way. It's Neith, and it was discovered <laughs> by Cassini in 1672, confirmed by Lagrange in 1761. It's named after an Egyptian goddess. And of course, back in those days, people had the attitude, somewhat uh, theological in nature, uh, of thinking that uh, because Earth had a moon, Venus must have a moon, right? I mean, that's, that's God's intent, surely. Um, and uh, there's even a book about this whole story. It's an amazing thing. Of course, eventually they figured out that Venus, in fact, did not have a moon. But there's a whole book about this, the moon that wasn't. And uh, it, was, it was even a, a topic of dis discussion among intellectuals in Europe back in those days, as in this letter from the famous mathematician D'Alembert to Voltaire in 1761. I do not know what has happened to the lackey of Venus, referring to the moon. I'm afraid it cannot be a hired lackey which has ceased to stay with it a long time, but rather that the said lackey has declined to follow his mistress during her passage over the sun. Well, D'Alembert didn't know much about Newtonian mechanics, but anyway. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> By the way, if you place the Earth-Moon system at Venus orbit, that's a natural thought experiment to do, it's perfectly stable. The fact that it's closer to the Sun is not relevant. The proximity to the Sun is of relevance for understanding the spinning of Venus, but not of relevance for understanding the stability of a Moon. So that's no problem. Uh, it is, of course, true that if you make the Moon mass uh, larger, then you can make it unstable or if you decrease the initial angular momentum. So there is a factor of two uh, issue here. But in most cases, there is no problem. And uh, indeed, it would seem likely that a story in which Venus had a moon at one point is a very reasonable one. And so one possibility is that Venus did have a moon. Neef did exist. It happened early, whereas the Earth-Moon event was late, which is supported by isotopic evidence. That's not just fairy tales. There's a reason to believe that's the case. Uh, the Moon then evolves out quickly to 10 or 20 Venus radii. This reduces the spin of Venus, very important. Um, but there are other bodies still around, and those bodies can have a consequence either through impact or through scattering, and they can even eject the Moon. So if you have Venus and its Moon and there's something else going through, it can ionize Venus and get rid of that Moon. Well, these are fun things to think about. But, seriously, uh, there is an important issue here with the rotation state of Venus, and now I'm making a connection to things that could be measured. Um, we think that the current rotation state is actually a tidal balance between two torques, one of which spins up Venus, the other one slows down. Uh, the, the two torques in question come from the body tide and from the atmospheric tide. When I say atmospheric tide, I mean a distortion of the atmosphere produced by the heating of the sun, but of course it's a distortion that is expressed as a bulge in the atmosphere, so it has a gravitational consequence. Um, this is plausible but not firmly established, and in any event, one might expect that these things actually have an evolution to them. They're not going to be exactly constant, and so it would be of great interest to get a very precise measurement of length of day on Venus. And there is another reason why the length of day on Venus may have fluctuations, and that is because there is coupling between the atmospheric motions and the solid body. And so this is actually an experiment that I would advocate, do a very precise measurement of length of day. The other interesting thing about Venus is that because it is a slow rotator, it is close to being spherical. The rotational bulge on Venus is like that. Uh, the rotational bulge on the Earth is 20 kilometers. Uh, the rotational bulge on Venus is so small that it is totally irrelevant. As a consequence, it is easy to reorient Venus, and so one could expect Venus to have rapid true polar wonder, and this too can be geodetically measured, and it is telling you something about the dynamics of the planet. These are suggestions for things to do. Let me turn now to the origin of the atmosphere. And presumably, as with Earth, the atmosphere came about through outgassing as a consequence of the primary accretion process. This is still controversial for the Earth, but actually the evidence is quite strong that this is the case. There are other things happening. Again, by analogy to the Earth, we have material that comes late, so-called late veneer which is best expressed by the uh, highly sidrophile elements that we see showing up in the mantle. Uh, we think that the atmospheric component that is associated with this is a minor component. We also think that comets are minor. So this is a good working hypothesis for the origin of the atmosphere of Venus, outgassing in association with primary accretion. But it is also of interest in the context of thinking about the evolution of Venus as a whole, to consider whether Venus grew to some extent while the solar nebula was still present, in which case you get ingassing. And there must have been, we think, some ingassing in the case of the Earth, perhaps well before Earth reached its final mass, because we see embedded in the Earth a component that is solar and this shows up especially in neon, where you have three isotopes to look at. This, of course, is an important question for making the connection to volcanism, the volcanic history of uh, 
uh, Venus, and that is one of the main reasons why uh, people, when they list things that you want to do at Venus, rather quickly get to uh, the noble gases as an important thing that uh, one wishes to measure in the atmosphere. The noble gases, the heavy noble gases, um, are providing a memory of outgassing processes. <clears throat> now, what about water? Where is all the water gone? For indeed, if we think that Earth and Venus were put together in a somewhat similar way, Venus should have received of order an ocean of water, uh, and in fact, perhaps more, because we know that there's a lot of water down deep inside the Earth, and why not in Venus? So delivery seems likely. You can't, in any plausible story, say that Venus did not get water. And yet, of course, the surface um, the, and the atmosphere and the crust are dry. We know the crust is dry. That's a real logical statement. If you put water into the crust, uh, the, the topography, topography that we see on the surface would have decayed away viscously. Now, there, there, there is a story, of course, for the water on Venus, um, the quantitative aspect of which is still incomplete. And here the story is tied to distance from the sun, unlike many of the other things I've talked about so far. And the story is usually labeled runaway greenhouse. And so what people say is that a natural stable state, given the location of Venus in the solar system and uh, water in the atmosphere, is that the water cannot exist on the surface as an ocean. It gets up into the atmosphere, uh, builds up opacity, and you go to a new steady state where the water is all in the form of vapor. And then, of course, it becomes available for escape. There is an unfortunate terminology here when people talk away about runaway greenhouse because those words sound like a process that the atmosphere actually ran away from one point to another. This is perhaps incorrect because it's entirely possible that in the accretion process, Earth, too, had a steam atmosphere. And so perhaps a better way to think about it is that Earth and Venus started out the same, both having very hot surfaces, both having steam atmospheres, both having CO2 in their atmospheres, and the difference is that Earth healed because it was further from the sun. And then the notion of a runaway is not relevant anymore. Now, there are some issues with the runaway greenhouse. Uh, it's a 1D model. People think that 2D models are desirable, and the, the, the range of conditions is therefore still in some doubt. There is, of course, as I've already said, the question of whether the inside of Venus is wet or dry. We simply do not know. And there is a very interesting set of questions connected to the loss of water. Um, People who try and understand how this works find that the loss of hydrogen is diffusion limited, uh, uh, and therefore that the role of CO2 is important to this process. Uh, here is one recent paper on this question. Um, it's not that easy to get rid of an ocean's worth of water, and you may have needed to get rid of more. So there's some unanswered questions here. And of course, it's even possible uh, that the presence or absence of a magnetic field has an important role to play in this process. This is not very well understood, but it is an example of how everything is connected to everything else because it may be important to know whether Venus had a dynamo early in its history. So moving on now to the general question of thermal evolution and now getting closer to the issues of relevance to the workshop, we have a planet that is to a first approximation like Earth. It's got radioactive heat sources. It unavoidably formed hot. You cannot make a planet so that it starts out cold. That is impossible. Uh, and so it's unavoidable that you have mantle convection as a means of getting heat out. You cannot get the heat out by conduction and the interior would melt, and you would have a, an inconsistent story if you did not invoke mantle convection. And that's the reason why we think the planet should have differentiated. There should be a liquid core. But of course, this is a theoretical statement. And emerging from that also, you expect igneous activity. Uh, although the style of volcanism is unclear, um, 
when people talk about volcanism on uh, Venus, they, they talk about it as if it were closely analogous to hotspot volcanism on the Earth, uh, in part because of the morphological similarity and the geoid uh, and the topography, although um, in a few minutes I'll, I'll come back to that point because it's not obvious that that's the right way to think about it. What is true, of course, is that Venus does not have plate tectonics and that the convective regime may be a stagnant lid. So what is stagnant lid? I've said it already. It is the circumstance that you normally get, actually, in planets. Earth is the special case. And it's the natural form of convection when you have a very high viscosity near-surface region. Venus, despite its high surface temperature, is in this regime. That is to say, the rocks at the surface cannot flow readily. <coughs> and interestingly, if you are in this regime, other things being equal, stagnant lid convect, uh, convection planets run harder and have a greater capability for magmatism. That doesn't necessarily mean that Venus would have more uh, volcanism than Earth, because on Earth, plate tectonics takes advantage of pressure release melting to produce a lot of volcanism at mid-ocean ridges. And so paradoxically, you have a planet, planet Earth, which is actually running colder, perhaps, but has more volcanism because the material can be pressure released, adiabatically released, to near zero pressure. And of course, in the case of the Earth, although we don't know exactly what's going on, the suspicion is that water is playing an important role. Certainly, we know that water lubricates the asthenosphere. That is to say, water in the mantle rocks beneath the lithosphere lowers the viscosity. And when that water is put into the melt during partial melting, which is where it prefers to be, the residue that's left behind is stiff. And so one has a natural understanding in that picture for why you have plates, for why you have lubrication. And in that sense, you could say that water defines the plates. And of course, Earth has a cycle, a water cycle. Water coming out uh, in volcanic activity, taken back down in subduction zones, although a lot of it gets flushed out near the surface. And uh, I would argue that plate tectonics also helps what's going on in the outer core of the Earth by promoting core cooling, for indeed plate tectonics is particularly efficient in cooling the Earth. And so in that sense, there is, at least in the case of the Earth, this remarkable connection that water is connected to plate tectonics, which is connected to the magnetic field, and these all influence the presence of life. And the absence of these things on Venus is, again, all connected. Now, in the case of Venus, there is an idea that has been around now for a long time, um, primarily associated with Don Turcotte, but uh, also advocated by others from a geological perspective. And that is this idea that Venus went through a transition in its evolution. <clears throat> And the idea is often expressed as catastrophic resurfacing, although that's just the extreme end member of the range of possibilities that people talk about. And this perhaps happened maybe 500 million to a billion years ago. And the observational basis for this idea comes from crater counts. So what people do is they look at the surface of Venus, they count craters, impact craters. There are other things that look like craters, and that's actually part of the problem. But anyway, they think they can identify impact craters. And then based on our information about impact flux that we have for Earth and for uh, the Moon, one then concludes, after correcting for the atmosphere, which of course filters out the small bodies, one concludes something about the surface age. This obviously has quite a bit of uncertainty perhaps as much as a factor of two. But more importantly, uh, it's not at all clear from that kind of data that there is a sharp temporal uh, delineation in the history. One could instead have it spread out over time, perhaps with uh, resurfacing of Venus spread out through geologic time. So this is a controversial idea. It is certainly compatible with but not required by uh, the, the surface ages. <clears throat>
Uh, of course, people love to make models, and so there are people who do convection models, including plates, um, where they try to understand whether this is a natural thing for a planet to do. And those models are permissive. That is, you can put in parameters that make them work. You can put in parameters that make Venus episodic, so that there are episodes of resurfacing. Or you can put in parameters that make Venus just slowly uh, die away as time goes on. <clears throat> um, there are potentially other connections to this. If you look at the interpretations of the Magellan data for topography and for gravity, the inference is that perhaps the lithosphere, the outer region of Venus, is, is thick. And that might fit in with the idea that you went through a resurfacing event and Venus is now uh, in a low heat flow state. And certainly, the suspicion is that Earth and Venus are cooling in a different way right now. In the case of the Earth, we actually have a puzzle, a long-standing puzzle. It's called the Urey number problem, where the heat that's coming out of the Earth is more than twice as great as the energy that is produced by radioactive de decay. Perhaps Venus is nowhere near that state. Perhaps the heat flow is as much as a factor of two or even more lower, more, more closely similar to the radioactive heat generation. In fact, you can't even be sure that Venus is cooling down. And that's important for thinking about seismology. A change in convective style from a very efficient kind of convection represented here. This is mantle temperature versus time. If you have plates or a mobilist regime, you run at a lower temperature. If you then go into a stagnant lid regime, you actually have to heat up. It's even possible that we're somewhere in this state right now. So it's not at all clear that Venus is cooling down. And this is actually of importance for some of the ideas about seismicity. But before we get to that, a few words about the core. Venus, of course, has no dynamo. It has no generation of magnetic field. Why might that be? Well, maybe Venus's core is solid. That seems unlikely because the material that you stuff into the core includes antifreeze, and the eutectic of that system is quite low, and indeed lower than any reasonable operating temperature for the mantle convection above. And it is the mantle that is defining what the core does. The core is not an independent operator. The core's state is contingent on what the mantle does. So for plausible operating conditions for the mantle, you expect the core to be liquid, at least in its outer region. The other thing that we know about Venus, of course, is that it's a slow rotator. But what does that actually mean? From the, a fluid dynamical point of view, Venus is not a slow rotator. The relevant dimensionless number, the Rosby number, the velocity of fluid motions over omega times L, is likely to be much less than 1 for velocities that are sufficiently large to drive a dynamo velocities like those in the Earth's core. What this is just basically saying is that the rotation period for Venus is short to the convective overturn time. And in fact, in dynamo theory, this is desirable. So Venus is actually a better planet than the Earth from the point of view of rotation, although, of course, the, the field may be affected by the value of the rotation. So the most likely explanation for the absence of a dynamo is that the core convection must be absent, that there is no core convection. Yes, there is a metal. Yes, there is a liquid. But it's not convecting. So that's the third and crucial thing that's needed for a dynamo, and that's the thing that's absent. And perhaps it's because the mantle is unable to let the core cool as efficiently as you would like. And one way to do that is by going from a mobilist to a stagnant lid regime, but it may also just because it, it's always been in the stagnant lid regime. It's also possible that the core is stably stratified, and this is an interesting one because, indeed, if you build Venus differently from the Earth so that any giant impact was early on, the core will tend to grow in such a way that there is light material at the top and it will never recover from that state and stay stably stratified. So I think the difference between Earth and Venus in significant part may be related to the history of how the planet was put together. <clears throat>
It's also possible that Venus has no inner core. And the inner core is thought to be important, at least for the current Earth, for generating the magnetic field. So, a little bit now about volcanism. Uh, we have shield volcanoes. Uh, plume volcanism is a popular framework in which to describe Venus. It's always puzzled me, to be honest, why people jump to this, because in the context of the Earth, when we talk about plumes as, for example, Hawaii, we have this notion that they're very deep-seated and that they are feeding off heat from the core. But if that's the right picture for the Earth, it ain't going to work for Venus. And so I've never quite understood how Venus is functioning. This is an interesting puzzle. There are lots of shield volcanoes. This is, you know, there are hundreds of them. Uh, this is just a map of them on the surface. Uh, and then, of course, there are these other features, these enigmatic features, coroni, which are also volcanic in origin, but also uh, substantially deformed. Uh, many hundreds of these, somewhat smaller than the, what people label as the shield volcanoes. And there are also lots of other interesting things, like these pancake domes. And then we have the question of tectonics, and now we're getting closer to the issues of seismicity. Uh, we have, of course, a planet with a great deal of topographic relief, somewhat um, uh, fractal landscape, doesn't have the organization that plate tectonics has provided on the Earth. And one has, for example, in this recent uh, compilation by Vanoff and Head, uh, the various tectonic regimes, uh, deformed terrains, possible places for seismic activity, perhaps. So this is the spatial distribution of the various tectonized regions on Mars. One sees faulting, uh, tesserae, places where the crust has been thrust together, and so there's faulting, uh, a lot of deformation taking place. And here's just one example of what are called, in the case of Venus, tesserae, which are folded mountain belts, uh, a great deal of deformation taking place, presumably uh, connected to the underlying convection, but also intimately connected to the volcanism. All of these things are connected to each other. So what about seismic activity? <clears throat> well, of course, there's going to be a great deal more discussion in this workshop about this. Historically, when people have attempted to estimate seismic activity on other planets, they've appealed to the one thing that they were pretty confident would be there, and that is the thermal stresses that come from the long-term uh, long evolution of the planet, the contraction. And this goes back, uh, actually, originally to Sean Solomon's ideas, but in the case of Venus um, and, and Mars, suggested by Roger Phillips. This is now 20 or so years ago. And it's, it's amusing to think that, that this idea, which people think of as the most conservative way of estimating seismicity, is actually questionable. Because as I've pointed out, we do not know whether Venus is cooling. That's just not obvious. Uh, it's obviously connected to the question of the heat flow, so you would want to know the heat flow. There is, of course, mantle convection. Mantle convection creates stresses. And mantle convection is a heat engine, and so there's actually work being done all the time. And you can calculate it. You can calculate it for the Earth, for example. It's huge. It's orders of magnitude greater than the energy released by earthquakes. And so one of the problems, of course, is deciding how to partition the energy. So in practice, this is not a very useful bound. You can, of course, look at the surface. You can look at the tectonized terrain and make some estimates of, of uh, strain rates associated with that deformation. Uh, albeit with uncertain timescales, and you don't know to what extent it's happening right now. But there is the th scary thought that uh, some of this could be a seismic, of course, because although the surface is capable of brittle deformation, uh, and is, it's not really hot, it's nonetheless warmed up to the point where you wonder about how thick the layer is in which you could have uh, that kind of seismic activity versus aseismic activity. There is, of course, volcanic construction, albeit, again, we don't know to what extent it's happening right now. Other things you might think of uh, don't seem particularly plausible. What are the guiding principles? Well, uh, there's no good reason to doubt Gutenberg-Richter, 
um, which is a statement about the number of, of earthquakes per given magnitude range. Even though this is imperfectly understood, it seems to be a universal property of materials. Um, we don't, of course, know the upper cutoff. By upper cutoff, I mean the largest earthquakes. On Earth, we have an understanding of this in terms of the uh, area of contact of, of two faults and the typical offsets that you can expect over uh, the, the distances um, <coughs> that you have. Uh, in the case of Venus, it's not clear. This is actually of some importance because most of the energy release is, of course, in the largest earthquakes. That's characteristic of the uh, Gutenberg-Richter relationship that most of the energy release is in the largest earthquakes. And of course, on Earth, the largest ones are subduction zone quakes. So one of the obvious differences between Venus and Earth could be just that the cutoff uh, means that on Venus, you only have earthquakes up to magnitude 6 or something, whereas on Earth, of course, you can get 8s and 9s occasionally. You can, of course, um, use the identified or guessed faults, estimate the strain, lithospheric thickness, come up with highly uncertain numbers. <coughs> I took this figure, and Philippe, of course, is here, so he can uh, disavow it if he wants to. Um, but this is from the treatise in Geophysics 2007. And uh, I think the main point to be made in this diagram is that there are large uncertainties. So this is, this is the number of earthquakes uh, with magnitude greater than a certain number against seismic moment, uh, 10 to the so over here, we've got magnitude 6. 10 to the 18 is about magnitude 6. There's a direct relationship uh, between this number, uh, the log of this number, and the uh, magnitude the way it's normally defined. And uh, obviously, there are very large uncertainties. In all likelihood, one doesn't have the larger earthquakes that are out at this end of the spectrum that are characteristic of the Earth. This would correspond to much less energy, even though the general trend here is only a little bit below the Earth. But that is, of course, something we're going to have to talk about this week. So here's my final slide, and I've, I'm perfectly timed. Um, so things we don't know. Wish we did. Obviously, we want to know the seismic activity and the structure. It's essential for understanding the interior. We want to know isotopes, oxygen, for example, hafnium tungsten. That's crucial for placing Venus in context. I think rotation and geodesy are very important goals. I, I'm going to stress that because I often uh, see that people don't think about them. They think about seismology. They think about heat flow and so forth. But these ones are very important. Of course, we want to understand atmospheric origin and evolution. We want to know the water content. We want to understand the magnetism. Something I haven't talked about is electromagnetic induction. There are currents up in the ionosphere. They induce currents in the planet. You can look for that. This, of course, has been tremendously valuable for the moon, for the Galilean satellites. It's a very valuable technique. Heat flow, that's really hard. But of course, it's important. Igneous activity and volcanism. And of course, we want to do better gravity. Uh, gravity was only line of sight. With Magellan, we can do much better these days and better topography. And I will stop now.